Today's show promises to be really insightful for us all. Uh, one thing I've not seen in the news anywhere else yet or anybody really talking about is when we come out of the other side, are we going to be left with a lot of people really suffering with PTSD? And if so, what can we do? What steps can we put in place to make sure that, you know, for those that do suffer from it, we help them get through it. But also, how do we try and prevent en masse the global population being really traumatised from what has been obviously uh, a very, very strange period for us all, of course, this is touching everybody's lives, whether it be financial, whether it, you know, people have got COVID themselves, many people, of course, will have lost loved ones. So today's show, uh, I'm joined by Anna P Pinkerton, who is a psychotherapist specialising in PTSD. And uh, straight after that, my really good friend, Dr. Dan Mags, uh, is going to be joining us. We'll have a three-way conversation together, but more importantly, we want you to come on live on the show and ask as many questions as you like. Let's really think about the psychological effect of COVID and how do we make sure uh, that we get through this together, still smiling at the other side. Now, before we get going, every day we have um, our little competition. Uh, remember, at the end of lockdown, when we've finished our last in the series, whenever that may be, we're asking you to remember and write down as many of the food facts uh, that we've been putting on to your screen. Just write down the title and then at the end of lockdown, we're going to find out, uh, you're going to come in on, uh, uh, on YouTube, tell us how many you can remember, give us a list and, or however we do it, I don't know. But we'll find a way to make it fair for everybody and we'll pick a winner and the winner will receive over a thousand pounds worth of free jewellery or a weekend stay. Uh, with us in Warwickshire uh, at a boutique hotel and we'll all go out and, have, out and have a really healthy meal together. So what is today's food fact? Well, it's pork. And uh, I thought I'd pick uh, pork because um, there's a lot of uh, people saying, should you eat fat, should you eat meat, and so on and so forth. And for those that are still sitting on the fence and going, well, is fat good for you? I personally think as long as it's wholesome fat, it's absolutely perfect. But there's still people sitting on the fence. Now, the great thing with pork, it can be a fairly lean meat. It wouldn't have been 60, 70 years ago, but when that whole sort of hypothesis about fat was causing heart disease, we started to breed our pigs differently. So we used to have fat pigs, we now have skinny pigs, so they're very lean. They're a great source of protein with not so much fat. So if you're sitting on the fence on the fat debate, uh, pork is a nice lean meat full of vitamins and minerals, no carbs whatsoever and loads and loads of protein. Uh, there are also so many ways. People think, oh, pork, there's only one or two ways to cook it. There are so many ways. If you head over to Primal Living's website, primalliving.com, uh, and look at our recipes, we've got some amazing pork recipes, Thai recipes, we've got all sorts going on there. Uh, or you can go to our Instagram page, and on our Instagram page, literally every day, we're posting up new uh, recipes and concepts and ideas for you on you know, how to cook your way through COVID-19, because of course the restaurants are all closed, so we've got to spend more time in the kitchen. We want to make it exciting, but more importantly, we want to make it as healthy as possible for you. Can I also say a massive thank you? Over the last couple of days, more than ever, you've been giving us your cash on Just Giving uh, for a campaign to help the food banks across the UK. People start to realise now that we have got so many people in the lockdown without work and therefore unable to put food on their table at night. And so many of those people are families with young children. And I think the message is getting out now because more and more of us need to be putting our food into those collection boxes in the supermarket. But of course, we need the cash as well because all of a sudden, uh, there's more operating costs for the food banks because they can't have as many volunteers working in the centres as normal because of, quite rightly, social distancing. So what's actually happening is they're doing a lot of home deliveries. So thank you to everybody that's made a donation. If you haven't yet and you'd like to, please go to, ju Ooh, is it there? Uh, please go to justgiving.com and uh, it would be greatly, greatly received by the Trussell Trust, who we're partnering, partnering with, who are running over 1,200 and 50 food banks today and every day. 
So if you can donate, that will be fantastic. We've got some great guests today. We've got some great guest lines up uh, in the weeks to come. Uh, and in fact, shall we jump straight in? And before we get Anna on the sort of Anna's order there. Good morning, Anna. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me back. Oh, no, our pleasure. Loved it when you were on the show uh, uh, last time round. Uh, your book, um, which uh, is called Smile Again, I thought was so on topic right now because smile again you know, we, we, you know some people are smiling through this we took a straw poll of my five children at home uh, yesterday three of them are actually loving lockdown <laughs> and two of them yeah. just can't wait to get back to life as normal so you know it swings and roundabouts everybody's different you know my my, my four-year-old loves the fact he's not at school so does my 12 year old my son who's driving the show today desperately missing his girlfriend because she's locked down in Hong Kong um, but uh, yeah we're all different um, so talk to us about what PDS, uh, PTSD is and who's mostly at risk and then we'll talk about it in a moment and get some questions from uh, people the viewers um, how it will relate to COVID but what is it first of all? Well uh, PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder it's um, there's two types of PTSD there's one that comes from a one-off event, which is called type one trauma, where there is a very sudden, shocking and overwhelming experience. And that overwhelms um, the average person's coping mechanisms. And then there's type two trauma, which has a different um, set of um, characteristics. And that's where there is a, a, an anticipation around a chronic set of stresses and I think that COVID trauma will probably be a mixture of those because some people will have very sudden shocking experiences maybe it will be a bereavement it may be that they've become ill and only just survived themselves and or there might be something like somebody's lost their business um, lost their job their livelihood and so a very sudden shocking event plus the fact that this is a chronic situation will create different characteristics but that's why i've called it covid trauma because i think it will look different mm -hmm. those that are vulnerable are anybody that came into this already experiencing a great deal of stress and this could be the thing that just breaks them yeah one of the things that helps people um, reduce the impact of trauma is for them to be able to mobilize their lives and themselves in order to do something to help themselves or help others. And of course, in this situation, the chronicity of this situation where we're locked down and told we can't really do stuff externally to the house, people's ordinary coping mechanisms aren't there. Mm -hmm. So this now has a sense of entrapment, which makes trauma all the worse, actually. That is one of the characteristics that determines what the PTSD reaction is going to be like. Yeah, it, it's so, so true. Because, <laughs> you know, whenever I've got a problem, I go and see my mates and we talk through things. And you could say, well, you can still do that, you know, via social media. But uh, as I've been taught from Dr. Lustig, you know, the, the, the empathy side of the brain really only clicks in when you are together. The empathy side of the brain doesn't kick in as much when we're doing things. I mean, don't get me wrong, without social media and Zoom and all the things that we're using, life would be so much terribly worse at the moment. Yeah. But the, the actual, you know, to really kick empathy off in the brain, and, 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 and that will, of course, help with so many different things, you need that face-to-face -face interaction. So it is really, really difficult for us all. Uh, and, and thank you for explaining the difference between type 1 and type 2. I had no idea there were, were, were two different types. So we think some people will suffer type 1, especially if they came into COVID already highly stressed or, you know, a bereavement, a quick bereavement in their family might cause type one. Type two, you said it was more about anticipation. I guess that's to do with anxiety as well, is it? Yeah, um, type two is where you, you know that there's a threat. You know something bad is happening to you and your family, let's say, like now, but there's very little you can do about it. So every day you face it with a dread and that's the that's the particular characteristic about it. It's a bit like long term abuse um, of any kind um, or any sense of entrapment, like in torture or something like that or, or confinement. 
that the that you face every day or even every hour with um a lack of choices but also having to dig deep to a situation that's put upon you mm -hmm. so it's not that it come type one is where you're completely unaware of it like a bomb blast going off there's absolutely yep. no chance even a few seconds to brace yourself whereas this type of trauma in its chronicity is that you are facing adversity over a long period of time and in an, in a sense that kind of it changes the physiology of the brain it makes you think it makes you change your view of yourself and the world mm -hmm. so a good question just writing, just writing down there so should we break this down into two things that we could be doing do we break it down to what should we be doing for ourselves, whether we're already feeling stressed or whether we're okay at the moment but worry about how we might feel coming out the other side maybe like you say you might have lost your job may have uh, had a bereavement should, uh, and then should we also look at it of what should we be doing to help those that we love and friends and family around us if we see them sort of showing symptoms? Yeah, I think it's really important that people understand that their, that their reaction is proportionate to what's going on. I, you know, we talked about it last time. There's a lot of shaming about people's uh, fears and anxieties, but, that, but it makes sense. Like this is a massive threat. People haven't been through this before. How are they supposed to know how to react? And also there isn't necessarily a good way to react. And we have so little initial control over our reactions. I think what's really important and why it's important to have this conversation, or um, more of these really in the world, is that if people get a sense of what's going on for them, and why they're reacting that way, then it can reduce anxiety straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, people that have post-trauma reactions, it's very scary. You are out of control of your neurological system. So people will literally be shaking from head to foot. They'll feel nauseous. They might even be sick. They will have headaches. They will think that their heart's going to burn first out of their chest. What we don't want en masse is this population suppressing their trauma symptoms because suppression leads to depression and there's a very good chance we're going to have a mass um, population suffering from depression after this so what, how people can help themselves is is understand look up what trauma is not everybody's going to end up with ptsd post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress disorder because that's unusual at the moment the the um the population is about 3% that have PTSD. I think it will go up for sure because the level of this threat and the chronicity of it is just so extreme. I'm sure that we could be even up to 10% of the population. Wow. I, that's my belief. I, I've not got science behind that, but being in the field for such a long time, I do think this will break people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not about their, whether they're strong or weak. It's just about wiring. So, you know, the things... If you've lived at your, let's say you've lived at your bandwidth for the six months to 12 months before this hit, you've already been at your bandwidth and then COVID comes, what, where are your, you've got no resources. So those people will be vulnerable. And those people are used to being incredibly strong and driven. Mm -hmm. So to, first of all, allow the, allow your emotions, understand the symptoms because you're out of control of them. And you've got to be able to process how you feel, which is talk to somebody, yes. Mm -hmm. Get it out in some way. Look after yourself the best you can. And then it's going to be a different mobilization here, I think. And I think that's what the conversations are about. How do we mobilize in a way where we're confined? Okay. So the first thing there, uh, again, brilliant advice suppression leads to depression so it is one of the first things we have to do if we have any of those symptoms like you just said the, the headache the nausea the i don't know the anger the anxiety suppression leads to depression therefore the first is to, to realize it and say look this is a, 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 whether it be a chemical whether it be a enzyme related whether it be a neuro uh, a neurology related in the brain or whatever what you're saying is we haven't necessarily got control over it so the first thing you must do is not to try and suppress those feelings have i got that right yeah 
uh, that's the first one. Don't, don't, if you suppress them, it will lead to further um, traumatization because th that's just that's just that's why we talk about stuff. That's mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the our way, and the reason that is is because that take that takes it to a different part of the brain where it can actually be processed. So it really is important to do that. The other thing is is for people to not demonize themselves because they feel unwell. So I, you know, I work with incredibly driven people, business leaders around the world, and they're used to finding solutions for things. And now people are unable to find solutions. They will, they will adapt. And I think we're in a, the adaptation stage, actually. I think we're coming out of the shock. But this is, this is long term now. So people are going to have to find new ways to help themselves, their colleagues and their families. And they will, but it's going to take time. You can't flick a switch on this. But what's interesting about really driven people is that they can be in the knowledge of what's going on, but because they can't get themselves better, they turn it against self and mm -hmm. demonize themselves. You know, they go, why can't I get better? What's the matter with me? Why can't I stop the shakes kind of thing? When if, because it's neurological, you're not thinking your way into this. Yeah, so that's where I, you know, I've talked about we've got to be we've got to be careful that we don't think oh look people's mindset is to suffer or not. No, yeah, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of people don't choose to suffer; they're actually just suffering. Yeah, isn't the brain a funny thing? You know, it's along the lines, and you might think this is a bit of a strange analogy, but it's along the lines of why when I go into a hospital do I see so many doctors smoking outside <laughs> and you know they know more than anybody the danger of it but the brain sometimes is just the most crazy crazy thing and uh, you know why is it that some of the like you say the world's busiest business leaders that are so successful in some cases also suffer, suffer with loads and loads of anxiety and depression and stress it's that we must not underestimate the power of the brain and you know by trying to suppress it saying well this is not me I, I run a company and da 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 da, da. Uh, I can't be depressed well actually you can you you know you, you've got to not suppress these feelings and I guess talking isn't it to and, and that's why we have experts like yourself to to help certainly people that are you know highly successful in, in, in other walks of life to really analyze it because I guess the more successful you are in one sense whether it be sport or music or karate or business or a doctor or nurse you know successful at work the more you are in that one probably the more you beat yourself up when you start to get these feelings oh yeah absolutely um it's a big part of my work and when i talk about uh, turn it against the self i call it inner brutality and that's what i see a lot in very clever very driven people probably a large percentage of the population have something called inner brutality, which is where they've turned against self and that they've done it so habitually, they think it's normal to do that. And I think this is a perfect example where if somebody can't mobilize to make things better because all their ordinary toolbox is not available to them mm -hmm. because they're on lockdown or they're not in the workplace, they can't be distracted anymore. Like the doctors you're saying, having a cigarette, sometimes that's simply a distraction to um their everyday stresses and of course now we've got a massive part of the population who are suddenly at home are not distracted and they are facing themselves in a different way for the first time coupled with being with their families a hundred percent of the time which some people are just not used to mm -hmm. yeah some people will see that as a gift and that's great but there's going to be the opposite side of the spectrum where some people are going to go, but I'm used to flying around the world, yeah. providing for the family, but yeah. now I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. No, it's so, so, so true. And are, you know, there's some great advice on the NHS website. Uh, in my book, I talk about seven steps to happiness. Are the same sort of steps of, you know, t find something to get into, maybe a new hobby, uh, uh, try, try and get out in the sunshine, walk more, speak to your friends, uh, try and help others. Uh, are those things similar to PTSD? Are they part of the solution to PTSD as they may be to depression and anxiety? Or is it a different toolbox that we need to unlock? Oh, I mean, if somebody's got full-blown PTSD, you, actually, you, you, you have to do 
all of that is important. I would say those are the, those are baseline self care techniques. Mm -hmm. But if you've got PTSD, the, the, on the whole, you need to reprocess how the trauma has been um, imprinted on the brain. Um, you can't action your way out of it completely. So, which is why prevention is everything, because um, post traumatic stress disorder can take a really long time to recover from. It's going to, what I want to see in this population is there will be post traumatic stress reactions, but they don't become disorders because PTSD is a psychiatric disorder and is profound and can last a lifetime. And that's not what we want to see. So, I, I yes, those things are important. But I think you've got to understand if your symptoms are going beyond three to six months, I'd say that's when PTSD is diagnosed. But okay. which, that's why we're having these conversations now, because if there's something that people can do now yeah. that prevents the trauma. Now, for some, that's not going to be possible because frontline workers are facing threat and the the um, severity of the threat, one, and the length of time that you're facing the threat too are the major indicators to PTSD. So okay. for our frontline workers, that's going to be a massive deal. And I don't yeah. mean just in the health service. I mean, people in supermarkets mm -hmm. or social workers, there's a lot of background work that's going on here, power stations that, um, that we're not going to see. Yeah. And I think for me, one of our responsibilities and how we can look after people is to get this topic up front because yeah. there's a massive percentage of the working population right now that yeah. don't have a voice. They are not on. They are not visibly on the front line, but they're facing threat every day. Now this is brilliant. That makes so, sense. So, yeah, no, it makes total sense. So you know, let's. Uh, you're right. This topic needs to be you know, come up a lot, lot more because what you're saying. At the beginning, you said two to three percent currently in the UK suffer from this. It could be as high as ten percent if we don't. Uh, you know, start to react in advance. And what you're saying is, whereas type one, that you know, you couldn't plan for that. But I think what you're saying to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, whereas type two, um, you know, there are things we can do right now if you're starting to feel it already to try and prevent it from happening, because prevention is much much better than cure, because cure can take a hell of a long time, and I guess put a massive weight on on, on families. So, so yeah. if that if I've got that right with type two, prevention is better than cure. Can we have some tips then of you know, some more tips? You've given us a few already, but maybe some more ideas around prevention. Of course, one thing will be buy your book. <laughs> I'm sure because I'm sure <laughs> I haven't read yours yet. I promise you, I'm going to get it. I, I think I've already downloaded it to the Kindle, but it, it, it's on the reading list for this weekend. Um, uh, everybody still needs to buy your book. You still need to buy mine, even though we're doing the show every day, uh, because uh, all the money that we make from that goes to the Trussell Trust. Um, but give us then some tips around, uh, if you would, Anna, prevention. What, what sort of things could we be doing right now? Because um, I guess most people are thinking a little bit depressed, a little bit anxious, and have got you know, different situations and worries. What, what can we do around prevention? Yeah. Okay, uh, it's a good question. And um, but by the way, my book. Uh, that's called Smile Again, actually came from working with clients with profound PTSD for many, many years. And the amount of people that actually just asked me, will I ever smile again? And that's where it came from. Because when you've got profound PTSD that's been there some time, you really believe you won't smile again, let alone belly laugh again, which I think is a, a really good sign of health. So you know, that's where it came from. And it is just, it's a recovery guide, really based on my clinical experience. But in terms of what people can do now, first of all, allow how you're feeling. Do not turn it against yourself. It is not your fault. You have very little control of your reactions. But once you are aware of them, do your best to talk kindly and companionable to yourself. It's so important. Nobody gets better from trauma if they demonize themselves and brutalize themselves. So that, that is absolutely crucial to getting onto a recovery trajectory. Now, one of the major things that um, impacts the characteristics of your post-trauma reaction is who comes to help. So for example, in type one, let's say you, if you're in a car accident and you are stuck in the car, 
the longer that you're stuck in the car before anybody comes to help, the worse your post-traumatic stress reaction will be. Now, if you have a car accident and somebody comes to the car immediately, reassures you, perhaps helps you get out if it's safe to do so, but is talking kindly and softly to you and encouraging you um, through the experience, you will do better. And that's because it restores your faith in human beings. Now, the exact opposite is also true. If nobody comes to help at all and you are stuck for a long period of time, then your um, faith in human beings is ruptured. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is we, we can become those people. Who are we calling? Who are we sending messages to to say, how's your day? Are you OK? Because you become the helper. And that feels good. It's a good thing to do. It will help somebody perhaps restore their faith in humanity. There are a lot of lonely people right now. If that makes do you see what I'm saying? Oh, so, 100, um, you know, 100%. And I was actually going to keep you on this topic for as long as I could because I'm learning stuff here. So, uh, so what this, is, this is brilliant. Please carry on. Yeah. OK, great. So what I was um, I've been talking to really large companies about what they can do and they can be the helpers now in a different way. I mean, HR directors, HR departments are are new frontline workers. I mean, they've always, obviously, human resources, they've had that role, but they're being lent on heavily. But they are in a fantastic position to be that person, to put something in place, to offer their staff, their employees, something around educating them around trauma. It's really important. Helping them about how, why is it that the brain breaks down when somebody's gone beyond their bandwidth of stress? Um, how, why does kindliness and companionability actually make a difference? Well, because it restores our faith in human beings. If we've lost our mental health and perhaps our physical health in post-traumatic stress reactions and lost our faith in human beings, we're losing hope as well. And we don't want to lose hope. Did you lose me there? That was the most hideous picture of me ever. No, no, it, honestly, it, sometimes it might, just freeze, like... it might freeze on your screen, but on our screen, it's perfect. Oh um, my goodness, I, thank goodness. I literally frightened myself then. <laughs> no, don't get PTSD from the camera freezing. <laughs> um, please don't. Uh, we, 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 it was perfect, Aaron. Um, Dr. D uh, Jen Unwin talks a lot about hope as being um, so, so powerful when people are recovering from things. And she breaks it down into a, a beautiful acronym, which I can't remember it right now, but it, it's all uh, on our podcast series. But hope is so, so important, isn't it? And I, I love what you've been saying for the last five, 10 minutes. You, you've, you've gone down an avenue I've never really explored before about that. You have to believe that, that there are people there to support you. If you lose your faith in human nature and you're depressed already, you've got anxiety or PTSD, if you lose your faith in other people, you, it, it, it must be so lonely, and then you must be, everything must come inward and compound. Well, you and... lose hope, right? Mm. You lose hope. Uh, apart from being poorly, uh, you you actually lose hope. And what what's going to be tricky for all of us in any case is that when we come out of the isolation and confinement, we want to believe that that's a good place to go. Yes. And for some that have had a tremendously difficult experience here they're not really going to be resourced to to come out of this or want to necessarily and so yeah. that's you, why it's going to be a longer term thing i think do you think there's some silver lining here though in that maybe people that are lonely that maybe haven't had children haven't got you know, a friends network is there some hope for them though in the sense that as a country especially every thursday we're coming together we're clapping there has been i think a an appreciation for our care workers, our nurses, yeah. our doctors, people that are still working in the supermarket. I just feel, I'm, I'm shivering in saying this, uh, that the, there seems to be a stronger community feeling now in Great Britain than I probably, other than when we were, did really well in the Euros <laughs> and the flags came out, but other yeah. than that, there seems to be a stronger community right now than we've had in decades and, and, and maybe people are struggling to find hope because they maybe haven't got a close friend network or family. Is there some hope in the fact that, my gosh, our, our community is so strong in our country? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I believe there's hope, but that, but that's all very well because I'm not poorly. And I think what if we can demonstrate hope and warmth, I think the, the tricky thing coming out of the confinement will be that what we can't see now, where people are literally losing their livelihoods, people's livelihoods came to an abrupt end. And I think that's going to take some recovery and healing. Those are two different processes. Um, but if we can come together to recover together, i.e. recover ourselves, that's what it means, recover ourselves, recover our community, and then in the togetherness of community, then we can heal. But yeah. I, so I absolutely, in term, you also mentioned, I didn't thoroughly um, answer, I think, and what else can we do? What I'm noticing with people is that, this is from a clinical point of view, is that I talk to people about their inner circle, like what, who and what is in your inner circle of life? You get to choose. You get to choose who and what comes in, and you get to choose who and what comes out, uh, what, what you put to the outside. What's happening at the moment is people are living in an inner circle, but they're still looking outside of it. They're still looking at the jobs they had, the businesses they had, of course, the, the, the family relationships that they had. And I think it's helpful for people to come to bring their world in a little bit as much as we don't want to, mm -hmm. because this has been forced upon us. So it feels kind of tricky because we haven't chosen it. Yeah. But it helps somewhat to bring your your mind's eye a little bit into this into a smaller inner circle because what happens if we're always looking at what we had or what might be in the future is that we're always looking at the deprivation yes we're looking at what we've lost and inadvertently then we are looking at grief we're always we're in grief and i think that's the the parallel process to the the trauma here is like this consistent grief that we're in yes and it's not that it's not important yeah. but grief can be so overwhelming mm -hmm. that we, we we need to understand that you can put grief on the shelf and come back to it yeah which is i know that sounds a bit bananas and but, then coming in yeah. like this there's a great uh chinese proverb i thought it's a proverb from lao Tzu that says you know people that are depressed tend to live in the past people that are anxious are thinking about tomorrow to get real happiness is those that concentrate on today is that part of the solution let's not think that we used to have the big company the big company car the the great job and if we have lost it that was that's the past don't worry too much about tomorrow you know, how what, what gratitude can you show for today what the, the, can you find anything to be happy about today because if you can um, then then is that going to help us in some way if we if we're starting to constantly think about what we had and what tomorrow might look like then could that start to trigger uh, sort of type 2 uh, PTSD uh, well type 2 is happening to us so we have no control over that right okay so, in a sense so so type 2 doesn't come along as an attitude of mind it's an it's external stresses that we're having to face consistently that's really what type two is um i when i'm saying people coming into their inner circle only, uh, i'm saying that only for them to gain small bits of control when they feel so out of control got you. Uh, it, what's really important is that people if they've got something to grieve that they do grieve it but that they take little um uh, little pockets of time away from the grief because grief is the most painful emotion that you can experience. Mm. And that is because you've lost something that you can't get back. And you know, okay. we've got thousands of families affected by this, which who've lost people, thousands, and probably more to come. So that's very real. So it's not that people are dwelling on the on the past, it's that they have grief, it has to be experienced, otherwise suppression will lead to depression again. Yeah. Um, so I'm saying the inner circle only so that people can feel a bit more in control. Yeah. And um, it, I don't know, because if you shrink something, it feels manageable, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yes, got you. And, yeah. and we've got to manage this. We've got to sustain it. 
I think it's really important that we find ways to sustain ourselves and our families over months and maybe even the next couple of years. Yeah, some absolute brilliant advice. And there's so many people dying to ask you a question. Can we can we turn to the internet and, and see what people are asking? Yeah, let's go. Go for it. So, um, uh, where do we start? Um, Samuel says, what's the best way to approach someone who appears to be showing signs of depression after losing their job, but doesn't want to speak to their family about it? Oh, that's a lovely question. I'm sorry to hear that um, as well. The best way I feel is um, sometimes people take more kindly if you just say to them, you don't seem like your old self. So it's not an accusation. You're not saying you don't seem like yourself. You you just or you're not yourself. You just you kind of own what you're seeing. You don't seem like your old self. And also in terms of um, reactions to trauma, we do a lot of presumption and it really doesn't matter if you get it wrong. Sometimes you could even say to somebody, it looks like you're depressed, which would be understandable. Bearing in mind, you've lost your job or your business, or your relationship, you see. So sometimes we presume it, and that's because the depressed, anxious, and traumatized brain can't often see what they're experiencing because they're in it. Yeah. So it's really sometimes really helpful to gently but firmly say that, you know, you don't seem like yourself, or maybe it could be this, maybe it could be depression, of course. That's great. Lots of people, lots of people, by the way, especially men, as it happens, just because of their makeup, struggle to accept that they're grieving. Yeah. And everybody that's lost something will grieve, and it's really important to honour it. You know what? I, I wrote that down a second ago. I've made more notes today than I've ever made because <laughs> uh, I'm learning so much. Uh, grief, you, you said grief is when you've lost something that you can't get back, and I've never heard it said so distinctly as that. And and yeah. and. Uh, it makes so much sense. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Shan Hussein is a very good friend of mine. We had him on the show the other day. He says, Anna, uh, Anna's work has been a tremendous help to me on a personal level. Uh, thank you very much. That's, uh, oh, uh, thank you, Shan. Yeah, he's such a lovely guy. Tracy he's says, really yesterday is. you spoke about this uh, calcium test. I had a mammogram five years ago. Uh, due to another one soon anyway. They said to me had uh, calcium spots on... Um, Tracy, I'm going to put that to uh, either Cummins and we'll, we'll, I promise you offline, Tracy will come back to you on uh, that one. Uh, Nicholas says, Anna, uh, are we born stressed or are these learnt behaviours? Uh, no, uh, we're not born stressed on the whole. I mean, some babies are. Um, my first baby was. Uh, second baby born, well relaxed. Um, so we're, we're born with the capacity to be, dis to be stressed. We have to have stress in our lives and we have to have anxiety. It's really important. Uh, stress is our early warning system. We can't live without it. It's really important that we know. The problem with the chronicity of this pandemic is that it's stress over a long period of time. What, what humans like is stress for about 10 minutes, mobilize and, and do a good job, find a solution. Um, whereas what's tricky for us is um, to be in a state of too many stress hormones over a long period of time, which ends up toxifying us. Um, that's what we're not keen on. We have to have stress um, because um, we wouldn't, understand to not cross a road we want to know to see what i'm saying yeah yeah that's really really good advice you know without stress we wouldn't be here today would have been caught by the lion <laughs> or would have been yeah. run over by the bus uh, leah says this is great advice however uh, friends leave quickly after a trauma they want to help at first then too busy they no longer see you as the same person self-isolation self-isolation becomes your life uh, that, that's terrible to hear, Leah. And uh, you know, I, I kind of get exactly what you're saying. One of the things that, uh, that I'm very careful about with our charity, one of the things I learned about 15 years ago, was that so many charities, for example, go into, like, I don't know, pick anywhere, Wamba in Kenya that needs so much help, and they go in all guns blazing, all help, but then eventually just disappear. 
and they've done more harm than good because they weren't there for the long haul. Uh, is it, well, I think what people have to realise, if you're going to help somebody, you've got to make that commitment in your own mind, I think, to say, look, I'm going to be, I've got, I've got to keep that support going because if you turn that tap off, well, that's, that's tragic for the person that, you, that you're helping. Oh, it really is, Leah. That's, um, it's really important and it's, and it's true. That is a reality. Now, that can actually re-traumatise somebody because that level of rejection then catapults somebody to complete isolation. Now, trauma and isolation creates despair and despair creates people wanting to hurt themselves. And that's why this is such a tricky situation because if we could all come together and huddle together, this would be easier. And this is what I said last time was we're asking to be together, work together separately. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's counterintuitive, doesn't really make sense to us. Um, the reason why sometimes people move away from traumatized people is there is something called vicarious traumatization mm -hmm. where one person's neurology affects another. So okay. being around somebody that's traumatized is actually really difficult. Yeah. Now, if the if your friends are actually um, well resourced and they are companionable to themselves, uh, their compassion and companionability will never use them up. Often people go away not that because they because they can't be bothered. They sometimes um, can get a bit tired of the same story, which is unfortunate. You know, I've had trauma. I know what that's like. You tell the same story a hundred times. Yeah. Um, but also because their systems are filling up with the trauma and they don't understand, but they just suddenly shut down. Yeah. And which is why it's so important to talk about it. We have walking wounded in this country where trauma has happened to them and some and they're somewhat disappeared or they are walking around, but nobody knows that they've had trauma. So Leah, that's really important. I think in a way that would be a whole discussion on itself. Yeah. Yeah, a whole show on how to help others. There's a, a school in Redditch uh, that we, our charity, decided to support. And uh, these are for troubled children that have, have been expelled from other schools. Uh, and uh, we said, we'll help. And we, we got uh, seven or eight of our team at work, and I was going to be one of them. And uh, we went in for our training. And they said, the key thing is, if you're going to help these children, because we're doing one-on-one -on -one mentoring, they said, if you're going to do it, you've got to commit for the long haul because these children have been let down. You know, people have come to help, let them down. Come to, so they don't trust anybody anymore. And, uh, and in the end, I'll be absolutely honest, I stepped away from it. I never even got in. I, I organised it, set the team up, funded it, sponsored it. In the end, I had to walk away from it because I just was so worried that if I was you know, going to start with a child and then and not be there to support them for long term because of work commitments or whatever, you could do more harm than good. So we, yeah. it could be a whole show, couldn't it? How do we support others and at the same time make sure that we're in there uh, for the long haul? We've got some more questions coming, but I'm going to put those to one side because I'm, uh, I'm very cautious of the time. Can we get uh, Dan Mags on as well? Let's have a, a three-way conversation if we can. Hi, Dan. Uh, Dan, Dan. Hello. Sorry, sorry we're late getting to you, but I think you'll understand it's been a fascinating conversation. Sorry, Dan. Steve, no, that's fine. I've just got to say, Anna, I absolutely love listening to you. I'm very proud, Steve, to call Anna my good friend, okay? Uh, just like I am you, Steve. Um, and I love listening to Anna speak. Uh, and I learn so much every time. And Anna just has this... <laughs> this way of putting things that only someone who's such an experienced clinician can do, okay? Because what I see in Anna is those, the, the, the experience of years and years and years of explaining that to people, finding out what works best. And, you know, she's just, you're just so refined in your way of explaining things. And I just, I, every time, it's just like poof, mind blown every time I listen to you. And you know so, what? And you know what? You know what, Dan? What, what you, I've Dan. done in the, what I've done in the last what half an hour, I'm, my mind was going off about thinking about friends and one relative member, thinking, ah, that's what's caused that, or mm. crikey, that's the way I've got to help handle that situation because it, it, it has been fantastic, Anna. Thank you very, very much indeed. You're so welcome. Um, Dan, I'll tell you what, dude, let's do something different, Dan. Why don't you, because we've both been fascinated by Anna, why don't you pick up on some of the things maybe we've already talked about? Uh, or ask Anna to, to go even deeper on them, um, because it, it has been fascinating. 
Should we bounce? If you got any more questions, we could bounce that off, Steve. That yeah, uh, I have indeed. From the, that, uh... that, that, that's a great way of doing it. Uh, uh, another one. Uh, Hannah says, Anna, I think you're brilliant. Do you think people who worry more than others can change their mindset to live more in the present? Uh, mm, uh, kind of. Good question. Um, when I, <laughs> you might notice that when somebody says mindset, I get all a bit shivery because. Um, I call it mind jelly. We can rewire our brains, I believe. What we can't do is make a decision to flick a switch and go, I'm going to think differently. I think that's an absolute nonsense. And I think that um, one of the things I do clinically is help people rewire. And I talk about it, it has to be done so incrementally that it's like turning the dial very slowly but surely so that you can think differently if you want to. If, if, you do, if you're not keen on how you think, then, then great, rewire it. But um, if somebody has a propensity to worry, it could be something that they've already been through that you can rewire. If, if that makes sense, I, I'm not sure I thoroughly answered that. No, 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 that makes loads and loads of sense. Um, and, and the interesting thing I find is that I, I find that people that are more educated, that understand a bit more things, that probably worry more. Uh, I'm so uneducated, so thick in many ways, I worry about virtually it. People go, How, you must be petrified the whole time with seven children and running 11 companies. I go, no, totally the opposite. I'm so laid back and I, don't, I tend to worry about nothing. But then, I, for my example, my brother, who is far more educated uh, than me, worries about a lot more things. So also, I think my point there is, if you're a worrier, you know, it probably means you've got loads of skills and assets in loads of other ways. Um, and, and rewiring, yeah, that's such a good question. I um, think, Steve, you're doing yourself down a little bit there, sir. You might be less traditionally educated, but I've never read, met anybody who reads quite as much as you do, Steve. You inhale books for fun. I know uh, them for quite fun. incredible. I, I, I write them for fun, but you want to yeah. see my computer when it comes to the final spell check, mate. There is steam coming <laughs> out, smoke coming out. And, you know, you get that like underline and, and, and then it gives you like suggestions. Often it can't even work out. It can't even give me a It doesn't even know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Nor, nor do my family half the I time. I love that. Uh, um, <laughs> in fact, Tracy just says, uh, just started to read Fat and Furious. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Luke has said, how can we help friends and family who are silently suffering? That's a very oh. difficult. That's a very difficult one, isn't it? Because uh, getting them to to kind of open up in the first place. Do you think that's about? picking the right time manner or is it allowing people that space that they need? I certainly uh, know, I certainly know that I, I mean, I get a lot of people coming to the GP surgery say, and then they're worried about someone they're going through a, you know, a trauma or a traumatic event and stuff. And they're like, well, how can I, you know, get, you know, you know, they won't come in, you know, I can't get them to come in. So how, how, do, how do I, I don't always feel the best prepared of how to deal with those situations to be honest. I'd love your uh, law thoughts on this, Anna. Well, again, often it's because they don't understand what's happening to them or they don't. Some Often people will hold it within themselves because they don't want to intrude on other people. So in terms of uh, through a trauma lens, which I can't help seeing, um, we presume it. So so it's even if you get it wrong, this is what I was saying earlier. You could say, look, guys, you're having a really hard time or this is what I'm seeing. What can I do? And, and actually just naming what you're seeing is incredibly helpful. Look, I know that you're the kind of people that will suffer in silence and I'm here for you and I'm not going anywhere. I'm here and I'm seeing what's happening. You, so, so naming it, very, when, when you meet a human suffering and you know that their MO is to, is to suppress it and, and, and kind of pretend it's okay, when you say that you can see that, the human just goes for you, thank goodness on the whole, right? On the whole, 99.9% .9 of the time, they'll be grateful that you've named it and that you don't have to suffer in silence. I see you, right? Um, that, that's that, that's that, what you'll likely find. Isn't that a great choice of words? I can see that you're, that, that, that you're yeah. 
uh, or yeah. you appear to be like this. Because one of the things I was told off for once going, I went, I know how you feel. And they went, no, you don't. Mm. <laughs> so just the, just the right choice of words of, look, I can see that, that, that you're struggling with this. Um, isn't yeah, it I think important? Those little words are so important. Yeah, I think your choice of words is, is you know, Anna, so, I can see you're so careful with your choice of words, Anna, because you you know the, the damage that, that, you know, not having the right choice of words is. And I, I completely agree that, you know, I, I, I know how you feel. You know, it might seem like a really, uh, you know, empathetic way to deal with these things. But if, you know, and, and, and of course your intention with that in that phrase is always very good of yeah. course it is no doubting that but actually for somebody who is feeling like that it can be incredibly incredibly um cutting really that yeah. of course you don't know how i feel how could you possibly know how i feel and yeah we can attempt to emphasize but you know we can't necessarily always pretend that we know how somebody feels yeah. it's uh it's a difficult really difficult thing yeah yeah so that, that, that the observational comments seem to be much, much stronger. The other, the other thing that occurs to me, and it might be really helpful based on what people have asked today, is that people are, you can hear that people are keen to say and do the right thing. And that's what Dan was saying, is that intention is so much. Now, I, my belief is that because there's going to be such a massive amount of grief in this country, and grief is our scariest thing, um, I think sometimes just just say that you're going to muck it up, you know, say out loud, look, I'm going to get this wrong and I'm going to say it wrong, but I'm here for you. I can see that this is tricky and I know that you don't like reaching out for help. So just kind of name that you're not going to get it right. That just kind of it helps kind of yeah. lubricate the proceedings, so to speak. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? No, absolutely. It's like I keep getting... Um, People go to me, well, you're not a doctor, who are you to talk on health? So I even start off every time and I say, I'm not a doctor, <laughs> I'm not a nutritionist, <laughs> I know nothing about this, but I've got a lot of friends that have told me what I should be telling you. Um, but um, yeah, just to, up front, just on a human level saying, look, I, you know, I, I, I don't know the words I should be using, but I'm here to help you, here to support you. Uh, and, and the things back to what you were saying earlier on, that, that a, a lot of PTSD is when um, there's no hope where you've lost faith in, you know, the human race. Uh, and um, so it's, it's, it's all about friendship, isn't it? And just being there for people and support and being human around one another. Yeah. And, and in tricky times, yeah. in, in, in a way that doesn't feel the same. And the reason it doesn't feel the same is because we're not in that kind of proximity. And um, I, I think I was saying it last time. Um, humans need other humans in order to reflect themselves back yeah. so if, we, if we're around a, a group of friends and they know that we're good people they reflect us back whereas in this isolation we're left with ourselves we go I don't even know who I am let alone whether I'm a good person or not so the, the, the whole isolation compounds the whole thing but yeah. do what we can under the circumstances and say that it's not going to be perfect yeah. I don't know how to say this right but I think the suffering yeah Okay. Yeah. Uh, look, it's been absolutely fascinating speaking to you. The advice has been uh, brilliant. Uh, I think we've got one or two more questions and then I, I, I know we have to then wrap it up. But uh, Samuel says, Dan, if someone has already, it's a slightly off topic, but I think we should answer this one, Dan. Dan, if someone has already had COVID-19, are they safe? Can they get it again? Very good question, Steve. Um, I think we have to we still don't 100 percent know the answer to this um there have been some reports from uh various places around the world who have a bit of a, a bit more an advanced stage than we are in this country believe it or not um that that there are people who have had recurrent covid19 infections now they certainly warrant uh, or at least a second bout okay so they certainly warrant further investigation to find out whether that is actually true or not okay now uh, traditionally, what we would think is that that actually once you've had an infection, once it's very, very unlikely you had, would be able to get it again. Uh, the reason being is because what happens is your body creates um, a response to that. Uh, and whilst that response can then go down to a low level afterwards, 
the memory in your immune system is still there. And when you experience that virus, bacteria, whatever it is that you've already got over once, um, your body uh, calls on that memory to kind of explode the response to it. And you therefore don't get the clinical symptoms of that. Okay, so though, so if you've had this is why you get less cold throughout your life. Okay, kids, uh, you know, a, a young child, especially if they're attending nursery and getting exposure from all different areas, uh, can get uh, on average up to about 10 colds or respiratory infections in an entire winter period, huge amount. Okay, but uh, as you'll know, as you get older they become much more infrequent as you've experienced yeah. those colds, uh, experienced those different infections, and therefore you just simply, you might be exposed to those bugs, you just never show the symptoms of them really, okay? Yeah. Uh, same should be true for COVID-19. Whether it is true or not, only time will tell. Yeah. Um, there's some query about whether it's the testing uh, of that that is picking up fragments of the virus, um, that somebody's previously been infected with because they're very, very highly sensitive tests. So whether they are or not, or whether it's just a certain small subsection of the population, potentially with an immune problem who are getting a recurrent COVID-19 infection. We don't know yet, but the theory should be that once you've had it, you can't get it again. Yeah, thanks for that, mate. That's really, really good. Uh, to hear. Um, uh, my sister says hello from Australia. Hello, sister. Say hello to your auntie, Jack. Jack. Hi, Jane. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Marvellous says, uh, this is partly a symptom of orphans or children. Put, okay, this is probably back to my comment earlier on about um, uh, people that have been let down more than once uh, from Marvellous. This is partly a symptom of orphans or children put up for adoption. They do behave differently and it appears they have a fear of being abandoned again and again. Um, yeah, uh, I, I worked with a, a, a young uh, lad a couple of years ago and uh, he had uh, a terrible situation. He was one of many, many siblings. They were, they, all the siblings had been raped by the two parents. Uh, they were put up for adoption. He and uh, two of his sisters adopted by the same family. Life was getting back to normal and the two people that put him up for adoption died in a car crash. And uh, <sighs> I had this young lad with me for a week cycling um, uh, around the Alps trying to, you know, trying to get him back on track and, you know, and that is that feeling of constant abandonment, abandonment, abandonment and that's why they think people are only going to be around for a short term and I think that leads back to the question earlier on, um, I can't remember who it was that, that asked but I think you answered it brilliantly Anna, um, that you know, when somebody's had trauma, uh, if somebody's there to help, it's so important that they can try and stay in contact with those people uh, for a long, long time so they don't feel abandoned again. Yeah, I think it was Leah, Leah, Leah pointing, right, out, yeah. Yeah. pointing out that um, if you're the person with trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder, which can take a long time to recover from, uh, it, it looks like other people outside of you have got what, what they call compassion fatigue. Um, which uh, if people are truly compassionate and companionable, they don't get fatigued by it. So usually something else is going on in their lives or in their, you know, psychology. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, that was a, a profound example yeah. of, um, of those adopted children. But the, there's, a, there's a similarity there in the sense that when people come out of this trauma, how the decisions they make about themselves is going to be everything that creates their foundation for recovery. Uh, what happens for adoptive children when there's been multiple traumas and, and losses is that they um, make a decision about themselves that they're not worth hanging around for, yeah. or there's something about them that makes people disappear. And in that same vein, people that are coming, going to go through COVID trauma and come the other side of it, if they decide, for instance, they didn't handle it well, or that they're a bad person, or they're weak, um, they're not provided for whatever reason, they've turned it against themselves, that's going to be massively impactful on their post-traumatic stress reaction and their ability to recover and the time it will take for them to recover. Because that's the crucial element here, is that what do you decide about yourself under 
the uh, adverse conditions. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's, it's such a, such a tough oh. situation. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, Sorry. no, no, no. 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 It, that's just so Happy true. Happy morning. Uh, no, no, it, look, it's absolutely brilliant. I, can I wrap up with what I think is what I've learned from today? Um, and what I think I've learned, well, lots and lots of uh, where do I start with all the notes I've made. I think the key thing with that I've learned from you with PTSD is what we can do for others. And that is, it's about being human. It's about being supportive. It's about when you, before you choose any words to say, look, I'm no expert in this. I might say all the wrong things, but I'm, you know, I, I'm here for you. And then be there for them for as long as you, you know, for as long as you can, if not forever. It's, it's about support networks. It's about communities. It's about love. It's about warmth. It's about humanity. Uh, and it's not leaving people. The big one I learned was when you were saying if somebody had a car crash, the quicker somebody came to help and held their hand and calmed them and said, there's somebody here for you, the less the PTSD was. Therefore, this is all about being human and reaching out to one another. Yeah. It's, it's taking that opportunity to be kind quickly. The yeah. quicker you're kindly, the better it will be. In fact, it prevents post-traumatic stress disorder. That ends up being a post-traumatic reaction and not a disorder. So, yeah. That's a that's a, a great way to end there, Dan. Did you like that last bit there from Anna? That 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 human interaction, supporting one another, may take it from PTSD to what was what was what was your analogy that uh, the, what you said there? It's from a post-trauma reaction. So it's a reaction rather than a disorder. Post. Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely. No, it's so important. And I think, you know, as doctors, we've got to we've got to learn from this as well. And, you know, because we all, a lot of the people say, you know, I often hear I can never see the same doctor twice. OK. And in terms of that continuing care, mm. uh, you know, we have we have the, we got, do have this problem with the modern general practice services. We don't necessarily have the great continuity of care that perhaps our our parents and grandparents had with their family doctor, which yeah. who knew them through life and stuff. And I just mm. want people to know that it is OK to ask for the same doctor every time and even if it means you have to wait a day or even a week uh, sometimes to get that repeat booking appointment you can, yeah. there's so much value to seeing somebody over a, a prolonged period of time uh, as a as a in terms of a, the doctor patient or the clinician patient relationship and I'm sure Anna would agree with me on this one because um but yeah, so yeah, it, you know, just from my uh, small perspective as a GP, is it okay to actually ask people for that continued uh, care? That's brilliant. Absolutely crucial. Fantastic. You have both been absolutely wonderful. Let me tell people, because I'm sure they're going to hear more from both of you. Um, Anna's book, uh, Smile Again, uh, available on Amazon and Kindle, I think, isn't it, Anna? It is, yeah. Yeah. And um, have you got a website, Anna? Yeah, annapinkerton.com. Quite easy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of resources on there that um, to help you see where you are in terms of um, burnout spectrum and uh, long-term stresses and stuff. And, you know, just email me. It's anna at annapinkerton.com if you have any questions, worries. Brilliant. Brilliant. Easy. I think you may be inundated <laughs> by the end of the, uh, the, this lockdown. Um, and uh, Dr. Dan uh, is um, a superstar on YouTube. Not only is he a brilliant GP keeping us all safe in Warwickshire, uh, he also runs a, uh, a regular podcast uh, and can be found at carbdodging.com, which is all about can indeed. cutting down the carbohydrates. It is, yeah. The thing we talk, we haven't actually talked about that today. We Amazing, Steve. We did a whole day without talking about <laughs> carbohydrates. First time ever. <laughs> I'm amazed. I'm absolutely amazed. Are you ready for tonight, Steve? I am, mate. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. We will be there. We uh, at oh. work. We do this big zoom. We do this Brilliant. big. We do this big zoom in, and we put every single TV presenter out live to the nation for two minutes. That's uh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, yeah. Nobody gets nobody gets oh, away Dan. with it in my neighbourhood, Steve. I go oh, up I, on the, up on the rooftop and I will uh, shout at people if they don't come out and clap. So, but it's a no, southwesterly tonight. Really. It's a southwesterly <laughs> tonight. You're two miles from my home. I want to hear that 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 klaxon tonight. Yep. <laughs> Dan, that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, well done to everybody. Thank you, Anna, for coming in. You're Thank welcome. you, Dan. Thank you to our wonderful NHS, to all the support NHS. staff, to the doctors, to the nurses, to everybody. And uh, till the next time, uh, stay safe. Well, next time will be tomorrow, so stay safe, and we will see you then. Bye. Join me at 10 o'clock every morning live on YouTube. Simply go to Primal Living's channel and you'll see our new Food Bank Show. Now, the Food Bank Show is basically what it says on the tin. We're trying to raise money for food banks across the UK that more than ever need our support. At the same time, in every show, I'll be joined by doctors and nutritionists that are going to help us reshape the food that we eat. Because maybe there's a bit of a silver lining for our health right now. All of the restaurants are shut. The McDonald's, the Subway, the Greggs, they're all closed. So we've got to change our eating habits anyway. But with the advice of the world's leading doctors and the world's leading nutritionists, I'm going to help you reshape the food that you're consuming and hopefully boost your immune system to get through this very difficult time.